Yali Madeth, everyone, and welcome. We are so excited to have you here today to talk about falls prevention. My name is Aliyah, and I will be your host for this evening. We have an informative session planned for you tonight, led by two extremely talented and knowledgeable healthcare professionals. But before we begin, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Aliyah, and I'm an occupational therapist. A lot of people ask me, what is occupational therapy? And is it the same thing as physiotherapy? While there definitely are similarities between the two, as an occupational therapist, my job is to understand how people perform their day-to-day -day activities and how that's been impacted by illness, injury, disability, and older age. Often, it's extremely challenging when we lose the ability to complete simple day-to-day -day activities that we took for granted, such as bathing, feeding ourselves, or moving around within our home. So in the case of somebody that's been injured by a fall or is at high risk of falling, one part of my job is to recommend equipment that can improve their safety. This might include a walker, a wheelchair, or equipment in the bathroom to prevent slips and falls. This can help people regain their confidence and their independence. Another part of my job is education, which is what you're here for today. By understanding what increases our risk of falling, we're able to take steps to prevent, protect ourselves and to seek out help when necessary. Falls prevention is typically something we think about for our elderly members of the Jamaat. But I think you'll start to see that there are steps that all of us can take, no matter our age, to reduce our risk in the future. I'll leave it to the presenters to tell you more about this topic. So I'd like to firstly introduce Elwaisa Dr. Ashner Nagji, She's a family physician in British Columbia who works with vulnerable populations, delivers babies, and is a teacher. Born in Tanzania, she has consulted, volunteered, and traveled to 116 different countries. She founded and led BELIEF, which stands for Becoming Educated Leaders Inspired by Exemplary Females, a platform for women and youth empowerment. Dr. Nagji has also served for TKN in Pakistan, Dubai, Tanzania, and as a volunteer physician in Afghanistan. She also enjoys driving the Jamaati bus for our seniors. Welcome. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Nimira Abdullah. She was born in Dar es Salaam and raised in Vancouver, BC. She graduated from McGill University in physical therapy. Nimira has worked in many different settings, including the intensive care unit, general surgery, cardiology, neurology, and orthopedics. Her specialty is in the area of cardiorespirology and critical care. She currently works in the intensive care units and the ICU at Lionsgate Hospital in North Vancouver. Nimira has also been a TKN volunteer at the Aga Khan University in Karachi, Pakistan, where she has mentored emerging physiotherapists. Welcome panelists. A couple of quick notes before we get started. Um, for the Jamaat, you can download the slides at the end of the presentation. In addition, um, any questions that you have, please feel free to enter them in the chat box during the actual session. They will be answered at the end during the question and answer period. And without further ado, let's get started. I'll pass it on to Dr. Nachi. Thanks so much, Aliyah. Yali Malath, everyone. So delighted to be here with you all today. Um, this is a really important topic. Uh, when we're younger, we're racing around, there's a million to-dos. We never think of, oh, what happens if I trip, if I fall, if I stumble, I'm on the ground, what's, gonna, what's going to happen thereafter? And if we look at it, um, approximately every 20 minutes, somebody is falling. And oftentimes we think of that as in our elderly population, but if there's something that we can learn about, ways to make ourselves healthier and better from now, why not? And so today our topic is on false prevention, what we can do, myself, Namira, and as you can see, Elia are here to uh, share some tidbits with you. And so today we're going to take uh, what, so what, now what approach to falls. And so as we move along, we'll, we'll start to dive into this to see what we can do because we all have a role to play. 
So to get started, um, what are falls and why are they important? And so if we look um, here on the next slide, we'll start to see some of the um, main things that are going to be important for us to cover. But as we do this, it's first important that we stop and take a quick quiz. This is your time to shine and see what you think about false. So I have three questions for you. They're true, false, and I want you to give some thought as to which one you think is the correct answer. Are you ready? So the first question. There is a single reason for falls. True or false? If you guess false, you're absolutely correct. There's a bunch of different reasons why people fall, and I'm sure you can imagine all the variety of scenarios. Uh, I remember once I was racing off to a movie with Brad Pitt. Why wouldn't you run? Of course, I tripped and fell. Um, and that might be very different than, uh, you know, a, an icy driveway situation. So obviously, there's lots of different reasons for falls. Hopefully, you have a good story, though. Our second question. The risk of falling is higher in women. True or false? If you guess true, you're right. Unfortunately, yes, women, we have a higher risk, and we'll get into that a little bit later in terms of falling um, and our bone structure. And so for the women in the crowd today in the Jamaat, we hope you'll pay special attention to this. And the third question, falls are a normal part of aging. True or false? Obviously, not a normal part of aging, so it's false. And there's lots of stuff that we can do to prevent. And so without further ado, why don't we move along and start to learn a little bit about falls. I was mentioning uh, the fact that about every 20 minutes, somebody is falling. About 85% of hospitalizations in the elderly populations due to uh, falls. And so if we look at this, as we age, um, our risk of falling is much higher. And so unfortunately, approximately one in three seniors are over the age of 65 are going to experience some level of um, tumbling. And so as we age and being female, as we mentioned in the previous uh, slide, you're going to see an increase in stuff that happens, bad things in terms of how severe it is, all the complications and repercussions of that. And when people fall, you can see on the chart on the right-hand side here, there's lots of different things that we can um, have as a consequence, whether they're scrapes or sprains or strains, dislocations, concussions. Um, uh, and 20 to 30% of people who fall are also going to be suffering from these kinds of related injuries. And so it's important that we um, also think of all of these other unintended consequences. And so if we continue uh, to take a look at the um, pieces around falls, um, we'll see that the most common um, places of injury in terms of broken bones, if you look at it, are in the spine and in the hips. Uh, and for those people, if you've heard, oh, Mari Fui ni Anti ni Ma, as we generally say in our community, she had a fall and she broke her hip. Whenever we hear of hip fractures, they, they generally, 95% of them tend to come from falls. But also people skiing, snowboarding, for example, that forehand, forearm and that hand when you're trying to protect yourself and you put your hand out, those um, fractures that happen in the wrists, the hands, those are also common from falling. Legs and ankles are also there um, in terms of when we're tripping and falling, that is a common place of a fracture as well. We talked about women. Um, women, unfortunately, are two times more likely to fall and have fracture hips and having other fall-related fractures. And so um, we, we know that this is a, an important um, contributor to morbidity, so uh, impacts of uh, disease or in this case falls and then also in terms of longevity or mortality lifespan and so women are more likely to be affected here as well. As we see, 50% uh, of the falls uh, occur inside of the home and so you know we're going to get into some of this a little bit later that if most of the places uh, in our homes can be 
looked at, can be examined, we can try and find things that um, put us more at risk, and that's under our own control, well, that's wonderful, because then that means that that's something we can do about it. It's not so much about the curb or the pavement or um, this staircase that's outside. Obviously, that contributes, but you see that 50% of falls are occurring inside the home, um, and so let's learn about that and see what we can do. Um, the next thing is, if we look at falls and we look at the impact that it has on us, um, according to the Public Health Agency of Canada, $3 billion are spent a year on um, costs related to healthcare issues around falls. So this is a pretty big deal. And for anybody who's fallen, uh, I'm sure we've all taken a tumble in our life. Um, this has a big impact on our lives and the quality of our life. And so when we look at this, we can see potentially for those falls that are later in, in our lives or that are quite significant, it can result in the loss of independence, which we all guard uh, so closely to our heart. Um, oftentimes it can um, also contribute to cognitive decline, to functional decline. You can't really do things. You can't really mobilize. You're relying on other people. And in our community, we know that sense of mothaji is a, is a big thing that lots of people are quite averse to. And and so how can we continue to, to ensure that our quality of life is maintained um, and, and we mitigate things that are going to put us at ill health and uh, possibly even cost us our lives in terms of early death? If we look at uh, this, it's actually a downward spiral. And you see here on the right-hand side, this fear of falling um, is going to limit activities. People saying, you know what, Ajito, this is a really nice day outside. Why don't we go outside, enjoy the sunshine, go for a hike? And people saying, oh, you know, um, I heard that Badru's friend Sadru went and then he fell. And so I don't want to go because there's twigs and uh, I could po possibly fall. And so because of that fear, we limit our activities. And when we limit our activities, we reduce mobility. And when we reduce mobility, we become less physically fit. And then when we become less physically fit, we think, oh, you know, back in the day, I was strong. I was able to do all of these things. I was the lead of the hikers. I could go on all these long hikes. But now ah, that's not for me. And I worry that if I go, I'm going to be in trouble. And so this, this downward spiral from lo loss of fitness comes all the way back up to the fear of falling. And, and we start all over again in this, in this downward spiral. And so we see that the impact of falls um, can be quite significant. And so now we've talked about the what. The question is, so what? Why is this now uh, so important and why do we need to focus on this? So when we look at risk factors, uh, we talked about the fact that there's no one single reason why people fall. And in the same way, there's no one single risk factor. So you can see here, there's many, many things that contribute uh, from a biology intrinsic perspective, from our behavior, social, economic, and environmental factors. And we'll go into each one of these um, in, in a little bit more detail. And so when we look at our biology of things, um, you know, as we age, um, we, we gain more wisdom, we gain more life experience, uh, and we gain more risk of falling, unfortunately. And so as we, we age, we also have uh, not only the risk of uh, falls, but also the severity of the falls. Sometimes we have acute illnesses, so um, you know, an acute urinary tract infection can lead to a delirium, which can lead to a fall, and so that can be in the acute phase. Sometimes, though, we have uh, folks who suffer from chronic conditions. So, for example, um, somebody who has issues with incontinence. You might say, well, what does incontinence have to do with falls? Well, obviously, if people are getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, they trip on a carpet or they're halfway in their sleep and they're trying to make it to the bathroom. So we can see a lot of these other pieces of our health are obviously all very much linked together. If you have osteoarthritis and your bones are brittle or osteoporosis and more likely to break, um, and then those chronic conditions and disabilities start to actually factor into this. Obviously, balance and gait. Uh, I look at this yoga picture on my right and I think, oh goodness, you know, um, if only we could balance uh, our bodies and also our din and dunya in that way, uh, wouldn't life be uh, incredible? <laughs> and so, you know, um, folks who have difficulties with vertigo or having uh, vestibular conditions that also in fact um, 
impacts uh, people's uh, likelihood of falling. Uh, cognitive impairments, so uh, two to three times more likely to fall because um, people have decreased level of what can be safe. You know, if you're if you're climbing steps and all of a sudden you look at the step and you think, oh, that doesn't look so far down, I'll just I'll just jump down, but it's actually so much further um, because you've got the cognition is not really functioning as optimally as it should, and so that can also impact falls. In terms of vision, uh, that, that goes without saying, right? If you can't see um, or if you're having difficulty seeing, and as we age, we, we see things differently. So that transition from dark to light, or if we're going from shiny surfaces, um, we're at two and a half times uh, the risk of falling with regards to vision. And sometimes we don't see things that are hazardous. Let's say you're walking along and there's a pothole, but you don't quite see that. So um, that can increase your risk definitely for falls. And then muscle weakness, um, and hopefully we'll talk about strategies for this uh, a little bit later on, is a big contributor. Because if our muscles aren't going to give us the strength that we need at the times when we need them, we need to call on them to either avert uh, a fall that could potentially happen or to keep our bodies fit and active. That's definitely going to factor into this. And then uh, the reduced physical fitness that we've talked about that um, contributes also uh, as a risk factor. So that's the biology, that's stuff inherent to our bodies. What are some of the other risk factors that we have? So we have behavioral stuff. So, you know, if you've fallen in the past, there is that uh, English saying, you know, once bitten, twice shy, that, that you think, oh my goodness, I've already fallen, I, I felt that, that didn't feel great, I don't want to do that again. And so we know that um, the studies show us that if you've fallen, then you're three times more likely to have a, a fall in the same year for adults over this, the age of 65. And so that's the most uh, common predictor of another fall. I work in uh, um, senior care, long-term care homes as well, and oftentimes the nurses are calling me um, because people have had falls. Um, and so the fact that they've had one fall um, puts you at risk for, for subsequent falls. And the fear of falling, interestingly, if we ask uh, seniors why they don't do things, um, what are they worried about? 44% of them uh, say that they're just scared scared of falling and we we mentioned that that fear of falling also has that negative downward spiral the other piece is uh, medications i see this a lot with my patients uh, especially in the context of covid uh, you know folks are finding it difficult to have virtual care or to connect with their providers and start to make their own concoctions and so sometimes people will stop medications or change medications uh, take medications at different times. And so medications can uh, impact our falls in so many different ways. Um, first of all, depending on the number of medications we're taking, things can react with one another. The other piece is sometimes side effects can cause folks to be drowsy. Uh, some psychotropic medications for um, our mood, depression, um, insomnia, those can actually increased risk of falls. And so I think when we're talking about um, medications, we have to be quite cautious and cognizant and to consult our primary care providers. Um, assistive uh, devices, I know Namira is gonna talk uh, quite a lot more about this, but if we're not using them at all, I know a lot of times I've recommended that to people to say, hey, you know, you, unfortunately you're at a stage where um, you may need some more support um, and that resistance to using a device, ah, you know, that'll make me look older, that'll make me look more dependent, I can get by, I've been able to get by. And so not using it, using it incorrectly or not maintaining it, um, not having the right fit for you and all, all of those things, uh, Numira will get into a little bit later on. Uh, you know, we always say function before fashion, but sometimes what we wear, our, our um, clothing options, our foot uh, wear can be a big deal. So wearing slippers that are open-toed, uh, easy to slip off inside the homes, for example, or dresses or pants that are too long that we can trip on can also be um, small, simple things that we can actually be mindful of and, and try and, and choose stuff that increases and enhances our safety. Um, when we think of nutrition and hydration, that's also going to impact our, our muscles and we keep coming down to this um, muscle strength and ensuring our physical fitness and so uh, nutrition and hydration definitely uh, factors into that. Sometimes uh, risk-taking behaviors, uh, you know, uh, 
going down the stairs with multiple things in your hand. I'm I'm a big culprit of this. You know, I have all these labachas, all these bags and bottles and cans, and I think to myself, one day I'm going to look very graceful as I'm transitioning between, uh, you know, the stairs or the car to get to the airport, and there's all these things in my hand, and I'm trying to, you know, walk and look graceful. Uh, <laughs> And so sometimes uh, we take these these risks that are quite costly. And so um, being mindful of um, of those things, you know, I've heard stories of people saying, oh, you know, there was something on the roof. I just thought I would get a ladder and go up and fix it. And then um, that's a risky behavior because, um, you know, oftentimes people don't see that this small, quick uh, thing can actually have um, consequences if not done safely. Uh, obviously, alcohol use being uh, inebriated under the influence of alcohol and alcohol in combination with medication can um, put us at risk as well, uh, as can exercise, lack of exercise and lack of sleep. And so we think of all of these pieces in our life that can actually contribute to our risk of falls, and that's uh, behavioral stuff that we can change. And if we think of other factors like our social and economic, um, it's actually really surprising. Uh, when we think of our networks and we think of how much they give us, we don't necessarily see these side benefits. So right now we're having a conversation about falls. But if we think about our social networks in general, as I'm sure many of us have been over COVID, we might not make that connection. Right, that having friends and um, loved ones in our lives actually enhances our lives because we don't feel alone, we don't feel depressed, we don't feel isolated. We have um, um, a network of people we can call on to give rides. I know I, I drive the Jamati bus, and I I fast forward. Um, you know, to what my life might look like, and how do I make it to Kane when I'm at that age, and I feel so much. Um, gratitude for the networks that we have built in within our community where you know um, even though we're going to Jamaat Khana in different circumstances we have this social structure that gives us um, this resilience and protects us they're protective factors and so I encourage you to look at your own social networks the people in your lives to see if that's something also that you can call on in in this kind of scenario uh, low socioeconomic status, uh, poor living conditions, uh, low income, not able to afford things, for example, physiotherapy or occupational therapy sessions, um, devices, medications, uh, a poor understanding of things, all of these, again, holistically uh, contribute and um, add to the risk factors for us. And finally, living in Canada, if we look at the environment, there's lots of stuff in our communities, you know, um, our pathways, our um, ramps and curbs, um, lighting, uh, all of these things outside in the community are important for us, but also things at home, the stairs, are they even, do they have handrails, uh, the tubs, are they made uh, in a way that keeps us safe or do you have to take a huge step in to get into the tub or out of the tub or is it a walk-in, um, are there handrails and devices that we put in or can put in uh, to keep us uh, a bit more protective and safe and obviously if we look at this picture we're heading into winter um, that does not look fun to me at all um, but some people love the snow hey um, but being safe around icy driveways and shoveling and things like that and so all of these are risk factors that we need to keep in mind and so we've talked about the what so what and now we're talking about the now what what are some of the ideas and ways in which we can actually approach uh, falls and um, circumvent them before they even actually happen. And so I'll get us started and then hand over to Namira as we go through some of these prevention strategies. You can see that there's a number of them from vision to exercises, devices, behaviors, and we'll go through each one of these in a bit more detail uh, so we can see what we can do about it. So in terms of prevention, we're talking about um, diseases and we mentioned a few arthritis, diabetes, incontinence, uh, depression, there's so many different ones, um, and you know, as we as we journey through life um, uh, and we deal with some of these different things, what can we do? So the first thing is actually to learn about our illness. And um, I see many people who sometimes are very resistant to embracing um, the journey of illness. Obviously, a very difficult one. But the more that we can understand how 
our illnesses can contribute to um, our lifestyle and how we can, you know, turn things around for us uh, to manage them, uh, manage the me medications, manage the pain, and then connect with our um, the doctors. I know that I've heard lots of like, oh, our doctor, she's still working, and she's sitting in Zanzibar, what's happening, is she on holiday, but we're all here. Um, Technology has helped us as it has to be able to connect with one another, another just now through um, these virtual means. Um, that we're here for you still and we're working hard during the pandemic and, and happy for you to reach out to us so we can connect and try and support you. Um, and if you're injured or in ill health, then to um, be gentle on yourself, but to gradually increase yourself uh, while you stay in your comfort zone up to a place of that physical fitness level that um, you know would serve you the best. Uh, sometimes we need these Uber Eats and DoorDash. Uh, I know a lot of us have been calling upon them a lot more during the pandemic. But, um, you know, if health is uh, precluding you from going out and doing that, then, um, you know, that might be something to consider as well. Grocery services, house cleaning, etc. cetera. Um, and then uh, as active as we can, we've talked about some of these things, eating healthy, drinking lots of fluids, making sure that you can find activities that you enjoy, that you find pleasure in, um, but also so that it's maintaining your strength and your balance because if we um, don't do stuff then we actually put ourselves uh, at more risk. In terms of medications, um, you know, this is a big thing uh, that I have a lot of conversations with a lot of my patients about. Um, I, I try and ensure that we try and reduce what we call pill burden. So um, maybe that might be something to go to your provider to say, hey, look, I'm on a list of all of these medications. Are there places where we can cut them or are any of these putting me at risk for falls? So I think it's our collective responsibility to know the name, the dosage, the indication and changes of medications. Often I'll have but Dr. Nagji it's that you know it's that yellow pill the small yellow pill that's the one I take and I say I'm sorry I, I don't know what that one is if you tell me it's a blue pill or a house shaped pill maybe but the rest of them and so knowing the medications that you're on having a list of them um, please only taking medications that are intended for you sometimes I know people sharing is caring but not for medications uh, and so staying to the medications that are only for you and then if you feel like oh you know I don't need this medication or it's causing me side effects please have that conversation beforehand because some medications need to be weaned and just a note about medications that also includes over-the-counter um, vitamins and herbs so including that in that conversation and to have a review of these medications I would say you know at least once a year is a, is a good strategy maybe every birthday to to think of that as a time for having that conversation we touched a little bit on uh, alcohol and so um, being wise if you do choose to consume it, particularly in the context of medications. One thing I'll just quickly say is goals of care. You know, um, during COVID, I've had these conversations with my patients in the long-term care facilities. You know, if something were to happen, if a CPR intubation was required, what, what are your goals of care? And I find that unfortunately in our community, we don't have those candid conversations very much. And so for the sons and daughters and daughter-in-laws and son-in-laws that are listening, uh, maybe this is a dinner conversation to have with your family to say, hey, mommy, papa, uh, your mother-in-laws, your uncles, aunties, what, what are your wishes? And to go through some of that. So it's not all emotive when an actual event happens but that there's some foresight and there's some discussion around that um, I think that would be really helpful uh, the third piece that I'll uh, speak to quickly before I transition and hand it over to Namira uh, to take us through some of the other um, prevention tips and then also things we can do, and she'll show us some of this stuff, um, is just to talk about vision and to making sure that our eye checks are done once we, um, you know, 65 is a good time, sooner obviously if you need it, um, and to make sure that that eyewear is regularly updated. Um, and then thinking of colors in the house, particularly around stairs and switches, grab bars all of those kinds of things and to make sure that there's a lot of light uh, lighting our lives I use that as a very physical actual dunya v concept of uh, light but you know in our tradition light um, has a lot more meaning but you know il being illuminated and illuminating things that we can see obviously puts us um, at more protective advantage in many ways so I, I hope that uh, some of these strategies have been helpful I'll pass it over to Numera who'll walk us through some more of these strategies 
Thank you, Ashnar. Um, thank you to everyone that's joined this webinar to learn about such an important topic. And I want to also thank the team for giving me the opportunity to present to you today. So our next prevention strategy is on nutrition and hydration. We know that good nutrition is essential for good health. If we don't eat properly, we become weak, and hence our risk of fall increases. So what should we do? We should ensure that we are eating a balanced diet with enough protein. And protein is important because it is a building block for muscle. And so if we want to gain strength in our muscle, protein is going to be important. We also want to ensure that we drink enough fluids to keep us hydrated. And when you're dehydrated, you have symptoms of fatigue, weakness, sometimes lightheadedness. And so this is important for us to keep the fluids in our body. Now, if needed, nutritional supplements can be considered, such as Ensure, Boost, and even vitamin supplements. However, before starting any of these, it's really important to um, speak with your doctor. The other thing is research is showing that calcium in combination with vitamin D has shown to decrease the risk of falls. So it's important to try and get enough calcium in our diet. You want to aim for about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams, and you want to try from all sources. So some sources include milk, yogurt, cheese, fish, broccoli, soybeans, tofu, almonds, and leafy green vegetables, just to name a few. So our next strategy is on assistive devices and protective equipment. Now, these are things like walkers and canes, um, and they provide support and independence to those who have difficulty with walking. So it may be because of weakness or pain or decreased balance, whatever it may be. The important thing here is that, as Ushner had mentioned, if you have been recommended to use a walking aid, it's important that you use one. We often see resistance. You know, people are embarrassed or conscious, or you'll hear, no, I don't the walker, right? And so we have to think away from those mindsets and actually think that we're being smart by using one to keep ourselves uh, safe. Now, once you have a walker or a cane, whatever it may be, you want to ensure that it's appropriate for your needs. The different walking aids will provide different levels of support. So if you've been assessed and your support level that you need is um, going to come from a walker, then using a cane won't give you enough support. So it's ensure that you're using what's best for you. Also, you want to make sure that whatever walking aid that you have is measured correctly to your height. Oftentimes, I see people that are using walkers and canes that are too high for them. And they'll tell me that it's because it helps me to stand taller. Otherwise, I'm hunched over. And really, um, your posture has really no reliance on the height of the, of the walker, generally. Um, and in fact, if it's too high, it's not going to give you the support that you need. And as well, it'll cause you unnecessary pain and strain in other parts of your body, such as your wrists, your elbows, and your shoulders. So the important height is extremely important. Now, how do you know what's the best height for you? It's very easy to, uh, to set. Um, you don't need any measuring tapes. What you want to do is stand nice and tall. And I think I'll just show you. So if you stand tall and keep your hand down by your side, where your level of the wrist is, that crease here in your wrist, this is where your walker or your cane height should be set at. This will give you the optimum support that you need from your um, walking aid. The other thing to make sure that you do is make sure that you're using your walking aid properly. Generally speaking, if you're using a cane, it should be held in the hand opposite to the side where your leg is weak or you have pain, generally. Some specific cases, it might be the other way, but for the most part, it's the opposite hand. And also when you're using a walker, try and make sure that that walker stays close to you. You're not pushing it too far away. The other thing you want to make sure is that your walking aid is in good working condition. Make sure that the brakes are working, the wheels are working properly. Make sure that your rubber stoppers are not worn away or cracked. So ongoing maintenance is very important. Now, if you've 
having difficulty with walking um, and you've had a fall or a near fall and you're thinking, you know, I think I need to get something to help me walk and you're not sure, consider having a physio assessment. They will assess your balance, they will assess your walking and determine whether you need a walker or a cane or not. And if so, which one will be the best for you? They'll also be able to measure it for you and teach you how to use it properly. Now we go on to proper footwear. It's really important that our footwear is safe for us. So make sure that your shoes fit you properly, not too big or not too small. If it's too big, your feet will move in it, it'll be a tripping hazard. If it's too tight, you'll have pain and you won't be able to maintain your balance very well. Other thing is to make sure that your shoes have a good rubber sole so that you're not going to slip. In addition, avoid slip on type slippers. It's a good to have a shoe with the back um, closed back heel. And for the women out there, I know it's hard um, with our saris and our shalwar kameez, we wanna wear the nice high heel sandals. But as we get older, try and think about avoiding those high heels, especially the pointy ones. Now our next strategy is talking about the risk-taking behaviors that we had mentioned before. Um, and these are behaviors or activities that we're not capable of doing anymore. Maybe once we were, but not anymore. We think, oh, it's nothing. But in fact, the consequences can be quite severe. So some options, um, use of a step stool. If you can avoid it, avoid it. But if you must, make sure your step stool is sturdy with a handrail so you can hang on while you're reaching for things in high places. As mentioned before, avoid climbing ladders or chairs. I've seen many patients come into our ICU and our trauma units falling from ladders because they've gone up to clean the gutter or fix a light, um, multiple fractures, head injuries. It's just not worth it. And also climbing up onto chairs to you know, change a light bulb maybe. Store items on lower shelves and those regularly used items at arm's reach. When you're out and about, look around where you're going. So scan ahead so you can see any hazards that are coming your way and you have enough time to then avoid it. And this is especially true for new environments when you're in an unfamiliar setting. Try not to be distracted. How many times have we heard this? You know, asa wak mati vyas, vatu mechari vya. Dhyan and a step missed on our ways. We don't want to have those type of situations. So keep attention to what's going on. You can still talk, but make sure you pay attention. And rushing. Slow down. We don't need to rush for anything. One example is rushing for the phone. We have this innate urge to get the phone as fast as we can. So especially for those people who have mobility issues um, that are a bit slower, don't rush. You know, tell your family and friends that wait for a while. Don't hang up so quickly. It takes me a while. And if it's someone that doesn't know and they do, you can always call them back or they'll leave a message. When you're having to move heavy or bulky objects, um, ask for help. You don't need to do them by yourself. When you were young, you helped others. Now it's your turn to have help. Minimize sudden movement. You know, as we age, our body is less able to react to sudden movement, like quick turns. It'll easily throw you off balance. And avoid changing positions quickly. This is especially true for when you're going from lying to sitting and then standing. Often, if you do it really quickly, you'll notice when you stand up, you might feel a bit dizzy. You know, you think, oh my God, chakriya chedi. So go slowly. Go from lying to sitting, sit for a while, and then get up. When you're doing stairs, keep one hand free from uh, to hold the handrails. Even if you're carrying objects, try not to carry so many things in both hands. If you have to do two trips, that's okay. It'll give you that extra exercise. So we'll go on to the next tip now, which is exercise. And exercise is basically any activity that moves your body and increases the amount of energy that you use. So we know that regular activity makes you stronger, it improves your balance and it helps prevent falls. Now this may have been harder during the pandemic, but the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines recommend that we all try and get 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity per week in chunks of 10 minutes or more. So this roughly averages out to about 30 minutes five days a week. 
And you can do one session of 30 minutes. You can divide it and do twice a day of 15 minutes or three times a day of 10 minutes of activity, whatever works for you. Now, when you th think about moderate and vigorous intensity, what does that mean? It really is individual for each person. Um, one activity that's moderate for someone else could be vigorous intensity for someone else. Basically, a moderate activity is where you will feel breathless, but you'll be comfortable and you can carry out a conversation. So for most people, a brisk walk is good. Vigorous intensity activity is where you will feel breathless, you're borderline becoming uncomfortable. And now you're only able to probably speak a sentence at a time. So something like jogging. Now, in addition to this aerobic exercise, it's advisable to do muscle and bone strengthening exercises twice, uh, two days a week. Just note that for those that are at high risk of falls, um, you don't want to do high, uh, sorry, brisk walking. Um, you can get aerobic activity by doing even chair exercises. So those people with poor mobility, balance and chair exercises are probably what they should do. When you're choosing exercises and activities, try and choose um, things that will give you a little bit of strengthening work, balance work, endurance work, and flexibility work. Many activities um, have combinations, so you can get a little bit of all of this in certain activities. Now, if you haven't been doing a lot of activities um, and you want to start something, if you're going to start a new moderate to vigorous intensity activity, it's really important to check with your doctor first, especially if you have a history of cardiac issues or other chronic conditions, so they can guide you as to how much you should do and how you can progress. Now, how can we incorporate activity in our daily life, just even being at home? So we'll look at the next slide. So some things that you can do even while you're just at home, while watching TV, you can bend and straighten your legs. You can even add small ankle weights to your ankles. If you don't have weights, you can use socks, put some rice or any kind of dar in it, dry dar, and wrap it around your ankle. Those are weights there for you. You can practice sitting to standing exercises. Um, where the weather is bad and you haven't had a chance to go for a walk, you can mark out a path in your home. And imagine you're walking to, to some exotic place like Zanzibar or somewhere that you want to go to or have been to. While you're making chai, you can stand and do some standing exercises. Important to make your exercises fun because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not likely to do it. Some of you may like supervised exercise programs. So there's a lot in the community that you can access through your community centers and or your senior centers. Now with COVID happening, they might not all be running, but it's something to think about for future, hopefully inshallah, when a vaccine comes out. Now, exercises during COVID times, what can we do? So this is a little bit of a challenge. We'll just go to the next slide. So we haven't been able to do um, what we may have been doing before. Um, COVID has changed our lives rapidly. We haven't been going out a lot, meaning we're not doing as much exercise. Muscles can get very weak quickly. So some of the things that we talked about in the previous slide of what you can do at home are things you can do. In addition, there are a lot of online videos. We have two amazing um, classes of chair exercises and yoga on our II Canada websites. There are many um, resources on YouTube and government websites that we can access. You can even do your own routine if you want, but do something. Um, as I mentioned before, you can walk indoors. And if you feel safe to do so, walk outside in your neighborhood, but just be safe. Wear a mask, practice physical distancing, and wash your hands if you go out. All right, so our next strategy is the history of falls and fear of falling. Now we did hear that, you know, with this fear and history of falls, we're not likely to do um, the activities that we were doing before. So it's important to stay as active as possible after a fall. Sometimes after a fall, you know, we have we can take time to recover um, and we, we don't engage in the activities that we did before, but it's important that we don't let that rest stage last too long. Because as we know, if we continue in that mindset, then we will get weaker. We lose our confidence and our muscles get weak, which in turn leads to poor balance. And then we're at higher risk of falls again. So it's a vicious cycle that you want to prevent from happening. 
Um, so it's important that you continue to exercise, socialize, and participate in normal activities after a fall. You can even work on exercises to improve your strength and your balance. And if you've been recommended to do so, use the cane or the walker. It will help you to promote your independence and your confidence. So we talked about a lot of um, uh, falls happen in the home, about half of them. So what can we do in the home? So we have unsafe areas in your home, you want to fix them. Broken walkways, stairways, handrails. It's important. Clear debris on the outside of your home and your sidewalks or the up, leading up to the steps. Clear clutter in your house. So we're very good at collecting gussias that we say, you know, boxes, um, piles of magazines or newspapers. Make sure they're out of your way or not there at all. Um, removing tripping hazards. Electrical cords are one thing. Try and keep them tucked behind furniture so they're not in your way. Carpets and rugs. Scatter rugs are a big hazard. Um, your feet can get caught in them, um, especially if you're using a walker or a cane. They can get caught in them and they can be slippery. So if you don't need them, don't have them. But if you must, if you have hardwood floors and in areas like the bathroom or the kitchen, um, make sure your rugs are non-skid so they have a rubber on the bottom. For your shower and your bathtub, you can use decals or abrasive strips so that you avoid slipping in your bathroom. You can install things like your night light for your bedroom, um, bathroom, and hallways, especially if you're one that gets up in the night um, and you know, you're having to order the bathroom. Um, this way, there's some light so you can see where you're going. We talked about home safety equipment. Um, these are various types of equipment that you can install in your home to promote your independence in your activities of day to day. Um, things like toileting, bathing, dressing, um, and helping you to do that safely. So some examples like in the picture that we have is a tub transfer bench. So if you're having trouble getting over the tub, then something like this might be helpful where you can sit first and bring your feet in later. You can add grab bars on the wall so that you can hang on to while you're getting in and out of the tub. If you have trouble getting on and off the toilet, there is other equipment like a tub trans, uh, sorry, a raised toilet seat or uh, toilet safety frames, various different kinds of equipment that you can use. Now, if you are feeling that you're having trouble with that kind of, um, uh, that those kinds of activities, then you can always consider getting an occupational therapist to come home and do an assessment and then they can recommend the best type of equipment for you and how to install it. Our next prevention strategy, we talked about hazards in the community. What can you do? You think it's out there, what are we going to do about it? But there is a role you can play. If you see poor lighting, unkept bush bushes, and even sidewalks, you can report these unsafe conditions to the property owners or to City Hall. Not only will you be doing yourself a favor, but for others as well. You can find walking and bus routes with benches and resting spots so that you can have some time to rest. For transportation issues, you can use Handy Dart. I don't know what other regions or other provinces have. They have it's similar idea, but maybe it's called a different um, name. But we have Handy Dart here in Vancouver and BC. Um, for Jamat Khanna, we have the Jamat Khanna bus. Unfortunately, now I know we're not running them because of the COVID, but inshallah, as this uh, we you know we get over this hunch, the Jamat Khanna bus is also there for transportation. All right, so we're going to carry on now. We've talked about prevention strategies, and we talked about risk factors, but have we thought about what to do if you fall? Um, it can happen. You can do as much as you want, and it's not that you shouldn't prevent but you can still fall, so what do you do? It's really important to develop a plan. Some ideas are to keep a phone with you at all times. Um, like if you have a walker, you can keep it in a little bag, hang to your walker, or just carry it with you. Set up a speed dial so that you don't have to remember the names of the, pe or the numbers of the people that you wanna call. Another option is to carry a whistle. If you're in an apartment building, you can alert your neighbors. There are companies such as Lifeline, um, which provide a personal alarm that you can wear around your wrist or your neck. 
this is really good for people that live alone, that are high risk of falls or have had a fall. And what it does is when you fall, you just press the button um, and it connects you to a central uh, operator who then will get help for you and connect uh, with the family and friends that you have listed for them to be contacted. You can have a family or a, or a friend um, call you daily. And if you don't answer and they can't hear from you, then you um, leave, you know, you, they can alert, it can alert them and you can leave them a spare key so that they can get to you quickly. Check to ensure that you're not injured when, you're, when you've fallen. And you can do this by slowly starting to move your limbs, your arms, your legs slowly and make sure that when you're moving them, you're not having too much pain. And the other important thing is to learn and practice how to get off the floor if you are not injured. So I'm going to go through some slides to show you how to get off the floor if you're not injured. The first thing you want to do is don't panic, because when you panic, you can't think straight. So if you have fallen and you have done all the checking to make sure that you're not injured, look around for a sturdy piece of furniture, such as a chair or the bed if you're in the bedroom. You're going to slowly roll onto your side and come up onto your hands and knees. Crawl or drag yourself over to a chair. And if you're able to, and if you have a walker or a cane, bring that along with you. From a kneeling position, you're going to face the chair and put your arms onto the chair. And then with your strong leg, so in the next slide, with your strongest foot, you're going to bring it up and put it flat on the floor. And with your arms and that leg, you're going to push yourself up, move around to come and sit on the chair. And then rest again before you try and move again. Take your time when you're doing this. And if you don't succeed the first time, rest and try again. But if you're not able to, it's OK. Just stay where you are on the ground and wait for help to come. Now, if you're not living by yourself and you have a spouse, the way they can help you is not by trying to lift you. Have them help you go through these steps. Because if they're going to try and help you, not only is it unsafe for you, but they could risk falling as well. And then there's both of you on the floor. So you don't want to risk that. All right. So we're going to go on to do some practical things. Time to practice. So we're going to show you, I'm going to show you some exercises. And I only want you to do them if you feel safe and comfortable doing them. Um, and while you're doing them, if you have increased pain or significant increase in shortness of breath, stop immediately. What you're going to need for this exercises is something sturdy to hang on to, like a kitchen counter or a chair. Also keep a chair nearby. If you need to rest, then you can use that. The counter and the chair are there to hang on to while you're doing the exercises, but as they get easier, you can hold on less. Also, it's maybe safer to do a few exercises at a time rather than doing all of them at once. And generally, you can start with two sets of five to 10 repetitions and then progress to three sets of 10 repetitions for each exercise. So I'm just going to set up and then I will show you these exercises. OK, so I think you can see me. I have a chair here I'm going to use. So the first exercise is called a mini squat or a small squat. So you're going to face the counter, and your feet are going to be shoulder width apart, not too far or not too close. So shoulder width apart. And what you're going to do here is you're going to bend your hips and your knees as if you're going to sit down just halfway, and you'll hold there for about five seconds. Make sure that you don't lift your heels up and your knees don't go forward, okay? So you're gonna be sitting like this. This is a good one to work your quadriceps muscles, which is your thigh muscles, and your gluteal muscles, which are your buttock muscles. And you're gonna hold. When it gets easier, you can do it with one hand. And then when it's really easy, you can do it with no hands. So that's one exercise. The second exercise is called the bird or uh, sideways reaching. So again, you're going to hold the counter or the chair. I'm going to show you this way so you can actually see. So again, your feet are going to be shoulder width apart. You're going to hang on with one hand. 
You're going to shift your weight to one side and you're going to reach as far as you can. And you don't necessarily have to lift this leg up. Just even your heel can come up and hold for about five to 10 seconds and then come back and then you'll do the other side. Okay, so this is reaching, reaching out of your base of support, which challenges your balance and also helps you to work on that leg that you're shifting to. The next exercise is marching on the spot. So again, you're gonna face the counter or the chair and you're gonna bring your knees up towards your chest and marching really high, okay? Even just if it's in line with your hip, you don't have to go very high, just to the line of your hip and you'll do that. When that gets easy, you'll try with one hand and then with no hands. All right? Our next exercise is a really good one for balance. So what you'll do is you'll hang on again and you're gonna lift up onto your toes, hold for three seconds and then come back down and then lift your toes up to stand on your heels. Okay, so you're gonna lift up your heels, standing on your toes, and then you'll come down and lift your toes up, standing on your heels. Now, this part of it is hard for many people to do. And if you can't do it, then that's okay. You can just go up and come back flat, and then go up again and come back flat. And as it gets easier, you can do it with one hand, and then you can try with no hands. But this is a bit harder, even for me. This is hard to do, okay? So always hold on. The next exercise is a side leg raise. So you're gonna hold on, again, feet shoulder width apart and toes pointing forward. And what you're gonna do here is you're gonna shift your weight to one side and you're gonna lift your leg out to the side. Make sure that your toes are pointing forward. You'll feel this muscle here, your hip abductors working, and then bring it down. Now, you don't want to turn your leg out to the side. You're using different muscles there. Really important to keep your feet, your toes pointing forward. And also make sure that your trunk is straight. You're not doing this, okay? So just a little bit up off the ground, and then you switch to do the other side. All right. So the last exercise now, this is an also a good balance exercise. You're gonna try now to put one foot directly in front of the other. So the front heel is touching the toes on the back leg. And you'll try and hold this for about 10 to 30 seconds. And as it gets easier, you can try with one hand and then with no hand. And then you will also do it with the other leg in front. Okay, one hand and then no hand as it gets easier. Now for some people, this is hard to do. So a modification is you don't have to put your foot directly in front, but you can just step forward. Step forward and do it that way. And you can hold and see how long you can hold for and then switch and do the other leg. So that's a modification. Now a progression to the heel toe is walking now along the counter, heel to toe, heel to toe, and then going backwards, heel to toe, heel to toe. So that's a progression. One more progression, our last exercise, is trying to stand on one leg. Slowly trying to lift the leg up. You don't have to lift it very high, just a little bit off the ground and let go and see how long you can hold for. Count. And then each time you have to stop and you try again, try and see if you can meet or beat your record. And then you can try the other side. All right. So these are just a few exercises. There's a whole bunch of um, balance exercises. These are just a sample. 
and we'll provide those to you with the um, with the slides um, that will be attached. And that's it then. So I just wanted to say thank you to the team again for um, giving me the opportunity to present to you today and for all of you to have watched. Um, we hope that you have learned something, taken something back, and inshallah, we will be able to present in the future again. Um, and if there's any questions then. Namira, thank you so much. Namira and Ashner, thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge and all the details you've provided. It really is um, helpful you know for me as an occupational therapist to have the expertise of a physio and a family physician here today and i'm sure our jamath really benefited from your wealth of experience uh, so there are a couple of quick questions that we're going to go through um so one of the common things that i've heard people say to me um okay so i've fallen in my house uh, let's say I'm not really sure if I'm injured or not, but if I'm not injured that badly, do I need to go to hospital, especially in the context of COVID? Is that a good idea? What do you guys think? So I think that if you're not sure, it's always wise to, to um, not take the risk and go to the hospital. Um, there's no harm. Um, the worst that will happen is that you'll be fine. Um, so it's always good to not take the risk and, uh, and go get checked. Um, with respect to the COVID, um, I know there's been a lot of resistance about going to the hospitals um, because of the, the fear of COVID. But I wanted to assure you that the hospital um, have taken, uh, you know, precautions for that um, and you will be safe there. The other thing you don't want to do is risk not going and being injured um, and having a worst case scenario if you don't go. So even though the COVID is there, it's probably it's very safe. The hospitals are have taken all the precautions. So I, I wouldn't um, be afraid of that. And I would I would go to the hospital. I agree, Namira. I think that, uh, you know, if you've fallen and you feel like you need additional support, uh, we're here, we're gowned and gloved and masked and doing our best to stay safe. Obviously, there's uh, the provincial lines that you can call on the access line as well. Uh, if you feel like it's just something you need to talk through, but if it's something that requires an assessment, then I wouldn't hesitate. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, one last question. So we might hear this pretty commonly, especially in our community. Um, like you were, you guys were talking about the fear of like um, telling people that we've fallen or um, perhaps again, all of our emotions around falling, right? So what, um, so let's say I've fallen a few times at home and I am afraid to tell my children because I'm afraid that they're gonna overreact. What should I do in that situation? Um, that's a really good question. And children will overreact because they love you and they, they care for you. Um, I think it's important to, to inform your children. Initially, they will overreact and it's natural. Um, but for the long run, I think it's important for your children to know. Um, they can assist you to get help um, and you know help with preventing future falls. Um, they can help you to access resources that you may not have known um, to help keep you safe at home. So yeah, you need to tell your children um, and um, that I think in the long run, that will be the best option. Yeah, I think a couple more things are that if your children had something and they kept it from you, how would you feel if you found out so many, you know, months and years or weeks later? And so I think that's one piece. I think the second piece also is um, that those goals of care conversations can start to happen, right? So if there's more falls and other things to worry about, maybe this is a time where the children can actually come in and, and navigate those conversations with you. And then also, uh, hopefully our children and our Jamaats can pray for us, right? And yeah. so there's that idea of Mushkal Asan and we bring in the din and the dunya together. And so sometimes we, we feel a bit shy, but when we tell people, I think that enables us as a community to, to share lots of love with one another and affection and prayers. Completely agree. And you know what I think too, like we were talking about before, education is power, right? So now that you know some things, maybe you can tell your kids what, what type of help you do need, right? So you feel like you have a little bit more of a say in the process as well. That's right. All right. Okay, well, that's all we have today. I know we went a little bit over time, but thank you to Arjamath for staying with us for a few extra minutes. 
Um, and thank you again to our speakers. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, we hope to continue to learn more and educate our Jamath about their health.